Welcome back. I hope you can hear me. I am pleased to open this uh, session on Byzantine philosophy, and it is my pleasure to introduce Peter Adamson. I can see you, Peter. Hi. Hey. So I shall spend a few words uh, on Peter's curriculum and on uh, the, the volume. So Peter Adamson's Byzantine Renaissance philosophy is the sixth volume in the history of philosophy without any gaps series. Like the other volumes in the series, Peter succeeds at gathering knowledge for unacquainted readers and providing specialists with a concise reference work. A specialist in Arabic philosophy at the University of Munich, Peter devoted the last 15 years of his life to disseminating knowledge the History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps project sets its task covering the history of philosophy from the beginning to the present. It is a fantastic project that deserves recognition. The first part of the volume concerns Byzantine philosophy. In the first four chapters, Peter describes the state of philosophy and learning in late antiquity and the early Byzantine period. Chapter five surveys one of the fascinating trends in Byzantine intellectual history, namely the production of compilations collecting and preserving classical philosophical material. Chapter six to 11 cover the dissemination of philosophical scholarship in the middle Byzantine period. Furthermore, Peter accounts in detail for the fascination that philosophers of this period have for rhetoric. The latter was a powerful tool of self-promotion allowing philosophers and scholars of the period to ascend the, to the highest echelons of Byzantine society. Here, they could benefit from patronage as well. Imperial women were, in this regard, extraordinarily active and deserve recognition for this in a volume on Byzantine philosophy. Accordingly, Peter devotes chapters 11 and 12 to women and patronage. Chapters 13 to 16 discuss the production of manuscripts, the Byzantine heritage in medieval Georgia, and Byzantine Muslim relations. Finally, the last chapters from 17 to 21 discuss the late Byzantine period, which is extremely lively and rife with controversies surrounding the compatibility between philosophy and science on the one hand and theology on the other. For obvious reason, the first two chapters of part two on Renaissance philosophy discuss the transmission of Greek philosophy into Italy. In chapters 24 to 33, Italian humanism is briefly presented in its general features and is then analyzed according to its many facets. In this second part, Peter devotes three beautifully written chapters to women and their role in disseminating knowledge and defending women's rights. Afterward come the big guys, Pico della Mirandola, chapters 35 to 36, Savonarola, chapter 37, and Machiavelli, chapters 39 to 40. I found particularly intriguing the chapter on utopianism for chapter 42, and the transformation that Italian university underwent in this period, chapter 44. Whereas Plato and Platonism has had a considerable fortune in the Renaissance, Aristotelian scholarship discussed in chapters 44 and 45 also greatly impacted intellectual life. Mathematics and medicine are discussed in chapters 49 and 50, with Gerolamo Cardano as a dominating figure. Chapters 51 and 52 discuss figures such as Telesio and Campanella. And finally, Giordano Bruno, chapter 53, and Galileo, chapter 54, were two giants whose endeavors paved the way for modern philosophy and science. After this concise summary of the book's content, I would like to address a specific issue discussed by Peter in chapter one of the first part, which could also be relevant for the authors discussed in the section devoted to the Renaissance. A few years ago, Dimitri Gutas and Niketas Nyosoglu mounted a powerful attack against Byzantines concerning Byzantine philosophy as a, as a discipline. According to the authors, Byzantine philosophy did not exist, as ecclesiastical authorities regarded it as unuseful or dangerous. The authors believe philosophy is a purely rational endeavor incompatible with religious or theological concerns. Peter has done a fantastic job proving that this assumption does not simply question the existence of Byzantine philosophy, but rather the existence of medieval philosophy as we know it today. 
If we are to follow Gutas and Signor Soglu, several authors discussed by Peter in both sections of the book will not count as philosophers. In addition to Peter's obje objection to this exclusivist approach, I shall recall that philosophy as an exclusive rational endeavor is imbued with modern rationalism and more in general, with our current way of understanding what philosophy is or should be. So as a Byzantinist, I am grateful to Peter for allowing an inclusive approach to Byzantine, medieval, and Renaissance philosophy. Peter, the stage is yours. If you want, you can comment on some of the issues I mentioned. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So first of all, I should say um, thank you to uh, Petros and all the organizers for uh, including my book in the whole festival. And especially thank you to uh, you, Michele, it's a uh, real an, an honor to have an actual expert on these topics introduce the book. So my main area of expertise is not Byzantine philosophy, or for that matter, Latin Renaissance philosophy. It's philosophy in the Islamic world and ancient philosophy, especially late ancient philosophy. That means that I've always had a kind of fascination for Byzantine philosophy as a kind of side issue in my own work, because of course, um, First of all, Byzantine manuscripts are the only reason we can read any ancient philosophy. And second of all, or almost the only reason, there are a few inscriptions. And second of all, there's a lot of uh, continuity between late ancient philosophy, Neoplatonism especially, and the Byzantine period. So if we think about the continuing effort to write commentaries on Aristotle from a Neoplatonic view, which is something Michele has published about, um, or if we think about the debates about Proclus and whether Proclus is compatible with Christianity. There's there's a lot of reasons to think that anyone who's interested in Neoplatonism should be interested in Byzantine philosophy. And in a way, for me, writing this book was an opportunity to finally get around to diving into something I've wanted to look at more closely for a long time. So rather than just occasionally reading a little bit about Byzantine philosophy, which is what I had done before, I really tried to plunge into it and obviously wrote half a book about it. Um, as Michele said, this is part of a much larger project. So the book is based on a podcast series called The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. And the idea of the project is to do what that title or motto implies, which is to cover the entire history of philosophy without leaving anything out which I, I realize that that sounds absurd, and there's a good reason for that, which is that it is absurd. So as I always say, this is an ambition and not a promise. But what I'm trying to do is, starting from pre-Socratic philosophy, move through all philosophy, in not only in the European tradition, but also in um, India. So we have already had a book on classical Indian philosophy. I did philosophy in the Islamic world, which of course was um, dear to my heart since it's in my own special area of expertise. Um, for a couple of years now, I've been covering Africana philosophy together with G.K. Jeffers. Oh, I should say I did Indian philosophy together with John Ganeri, who is an expert in that area. Um, and soon I'll be starting Chinese philosophy with another co-author, which is Karen Lai. Um, so in a way, doing Byzantine philosophy was kind of obvious, right? So there's something to talk about there. And um, since I'm doing philosophy in all cultures, it never occurred to me that I would just skip Byzantium, especially since, as I say, I had other reasons for being interested in it. So the, for me, the real question was how to approach it. And here I was aware of other ways of considering Byzantine philosophy that I found a little bit dissatisfying. So one way of thinking about it is almost purely as a kind of philological phenomenon. So something I already alluded to and something Michele alluded to, the importance of Byzantine manuscripts in the history of philosophy, right? So one thing that one can do is say is just sort of highlight, hey guys, if we didn't have Byzantine scribes, we wouldn't be able to read Plato in the original Greek. And there are no uh, um, complete medieval translations of any of Plato's dialogue, so we wouldn't be able to read Plato in any complete form at all, if not for the Byzantine uh, manuscript tradition. But of course, that's not something that it would have taken me half a book to talk about. And it's also not, in, in a way, it's not crediting the Byzantines with any of their own philosophical ideas. 
So even though it's important and I highlighted it and I had a whole chapter on manuscripts actually, in the podcast, I also interviewed um, Oliver Primavesi, my colleague here in Munich about Byzantine manuscripts. So I'd certainly tried to do justice to that topic, but I didn't wanna just kind of say that and then move on to the Latin Renaissance. Um, the other thing though that I didn't want to do is restrict Byzantine philosophy to, again, something I've already mentioned, which is this idea that there's a kind of continuity, especially with the commentary tradition that we find in late ancient, ancient Alexandria. And I think, um, I mean, if, if you look, for example, at uh, the books that Katerina Erotiakonou has edited on Byzantine philosophy, she and her collaborators have focused very much on, not exclusively, but very much on the continuation of the commentary tradition. So I think that's really important, but because my podcast has a very kind of open-ended, let's look at everything sort of policy in general, I really wanted to push the boundaries and see where else we could think about Byzantine culture as being philosophically interesting. So one thing that I think is maybe worth knowing for this audience is that I wind up looking at a lot of things that for Byzantinists are very familiar topics, like iconoclasm, doesn't get much more familiar than that in Byzantine studies, or, or historiography. So I talk about Anna Kamnina and other historians, Michael Spelos, and other historians who had philosophical interests. And I try to talk about the relationship between their history writing and their philosophy writing. Or hesychasm is another thing that I talk about. So I have a whole chapter on Palamas. Um, so what, what I'm trying to do there is look at things that often are not considered to be part of the history of philosophy, but from a philosophical point of view, by talking about how they were, how these phenomena were informed by philosophical ideas. So for example, how iconoclasm relates to um, ancient theories about how images relate to their exemplars, um, or just the intrinsic like philosophical ideas that are present in something like hesychasm. So people often think that that's not a philosophical phenomenon because it's mis it's mystical, and people like to divide mysticism apart from philosophy. But just in general, in the whole project, I've always tried to integrate mysticism into the story. So I also talked about mysticism in Latin medieval philosophy and in Islamic philosophy and Jewish philosophy. So again, it was kind of natural, um, having done all that, to do the same thing with hesychasm. Um, so that means that I had a, a, a very broad, what I would hope counts, <laughs> at least that's what I was trying to do, was to take a very broad approach to Byzantine philosophy. And I think it would be fair to say that what I was trying to do is write an introduction to Byzantine philosophy that was as broad-minded as possible about, as far as the question goes, like what would count as philosophical in Byzantine culture. So you could almost think of it as the opposite of the Guta Sinisoglu approach. So their approach, and of course, as Michele said, they have a very they have arguments for their view, right? So their approach is if it's not like obviously philosophy, completely secular, completely rationalist, and probably very closely related to Aristotle, then it doesn't count as philosophy. So, I mean, you can do that, but obviously you get very little philosophy, as they say, out of Byzantine culture. I'm going all the way in the other direction and thinking about Byzantine philosophy in a kind of maximalist way. And I realized that's controversial, but on the other hand, <laughs> this might sound a little bit flippant, but something I sometimes say about this is, well, the worst that happens is that we cover some non-philosophy by mistake and we learn some stuff we didn't actually need to know as historians of philosophy, that doesn't seem like the worst result, right? So if you sort of read the chapter about iconoclasm, let's say, and you think, oh, that wasn't very philosophical, well, you still learn something about iconoclasm, so, you know, what's the harm, right? So, so and also, I, I guess I'm sort of happy to be on the maximalist side rather than the minimalist side, just in order that somebody's taking the maximalist approach, basically. So um, the upshot of all that is that I had many more um, topics to discuss than I think people would have expected me to cover. Because of course, I mean, ultimately this is a book, the whole series is aimed at a kind of broad uh, audience, not at specialists. And I don't think your average kind of casual listener or reader would have expected um, uh, 
sorry, I might have lost my connection there for a second. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I don't think the average reader would have. Sorry, can you still hear me? Uh, I can hear you, Peter. Okay, sorry. The, there was some sort of slow connection. Um, so I was just going to say, I don't think many people would have expected so much coverage of Byzantine philosophy in this series. But even with this maximalist approach, I have to count, there, there's 21 chapters on Byzantine philosophy. And on average, these books have about um, 60 chapters, not 20. So for that reason, um, I was sort of pro for practical reasons, I kind of had to combine Byzantine philosophy with coverage of uh, the Latin Renaissance. And at first I thought, oh, that's a little, that might be a little bit strange, but rather than having like a very short book on Byzantine philosophy, and then a book that's on the short side about the Latin Renaissance, I'd rather have one decent sized book that talks about both. But then once I started actually writing it, I realized that that's actually exactly what you should do. <laughs> so this is something that I only really uh, chose to do originally for pragmatic reasons, but it turned out to be, I think just in terms of like reasons having to do with the content, it turned out to be a really good way to present the material precisely because there's so much continuity between Byzantine philosophy and the Italian Renaissance, which is really all that's covered in this book. So I, I sh maybe I should have said at the beginning that Renaissance philosophy is a very broad phenomenon that also obviously involves Northern Europe. And I'm covering that in a further series and book, which, I, which is going on right now in the podcast. Um, so like Erasmus, for example, is not in this book because this book is only about Byzantine philosophy and the Italian Renaissance. But especially because I was doing that, um, the, the, I was able to really present Italian humanism as a kind of consequence and continuation of Greek humanism. And I really came to think that humanism is a Byzantine phenomenon that was passed on to Italy through the kind of transition from Greek philosophy to Latin philosophy. So if you think about someone like Ficino or Pico, there are many, many ways in which they resonate with Byzantine philosophy. And even, you know, if you think even about, again, about the manuscripts and the philological work that was being done by these humanists, they learned to do that from emigres from Byzantium, and they were carrying on a tradition of philological effort that was um, pioneered by Byzantine humanists or philologists. So um, I, try, I really tried to kind of emphasize that. I also... Uh, tried to do other things that would make it clear that there was a lot of resonance between the two traditions. So for one, one thing, I have a chapter on Byzantine historiography, as I mentioned, and then I have a chapter on Italian Renaissance historiography to try to get you to see that there's this sort of parallel um, or resonance between the two traditions. Um, so actually, th this I, I think this is a great example of the way that sometimes when you're embarked on a, pub on a publishing project like this, you might find yourself forced to do certain things just by the pragmatic considerations and then find out that it's exactly what you should have done if you'd known what you were doing. <laughs> you would have chosen to do it uh, that way in the first place. So I felt very uh, kind of lucky the way things worked out. And I found it an extremely fascinating and informative thing to take on. And I hope that readers also get something out of it. So thanks again, Michele. And um, I'm curious to see what questions we get.